Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Lorraine Grant. I'm the director of the barn, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all in the room and uh, across the country and potentially globally through the power of our webinar uh, to this evening's discussion um, on the deep wealth of this nation, Scotland, uh, with Newton Harrison and a team from the Centre to study the force majeure in Santa Cruz. Um, we are hugely honoured and privileged to be able to host this second conversation of our project uh, here at the Barn in Aberdeenshire. Um, it's really significant to us as Aberdeenshire's main arts organisation to have the opportunity. Um, really, this project sort of galvanises almost two decades of interest in the environment, in ecology and in collaborative working. Um, this is really um, what we're about here. It's what we see the function and purpose of our organisation being. Uh, and it's hugely exciting to now be in a position as an organisation to work with a highly skilled uh, experienced and highly esteemed artist such as Newton Harrison uh, to guide us through uh, really what is perhaps one of the most important conversations that we need to have in the 21st century. Um, so the format uh, of this evening, um, we will have a quick intro just now and I'll hand over to Newton, who's gonna do a few moments um, of introduction to the project from, uh, from the centre. Um, and then we'll, we'll see the new film that's been put together um, by Newton and his team uh, looking at uh, the deep wealth of the nation. Following the film, we will have an opportunity for you all to ask questions, uh, either through the room and anyone who's on webinar will be able to email questions in and uh, Mark Hope will uh, relay those to Newton. Uh, we are going to repeat the question um, as it comes in to ensure that Newton's heard it correctly. Um, and yes, so we really encourage all of you to contribute um, and to, to take forward the debate and discussion tonight. As I mentioned, uh, all projects, and this one particularly, uh, really has started to develop and build momentum uh, in the process of collaboration. Uh, and many people, many agencies have really generously given of their time their support and expertise uh, since Newton's first visit in August. So uh, again, on behalf of the board um, of the barn and the team here, I just want to extend uh, our thanks for your support and encouragement so far. Um, I'd also like to make uh, a particular thanks uh, to the team from the Hutton Institute uh, who have, uh, through some access to Safari funding, uh, allowed this evening's events to be possible. Um, so, with further ado, I shall uh, pass over uh, to Newton in uh, Santa Cruz and hopefully he will uh, pick up the conversation from here. Um, afterwards, please join us in the bar for more networking and uh, we really want to maximise this opportunity we have this evening. Hello everybody, a multitude. Um, uh, Mark and all, I really like to thank you for the vast labor you've put into this, uh, as have we, as have we. There's something about this, this project that's evocative of a lot of work, um, but, the, but gratifying work and work needing to be done. So um, we're having a whale of, time, whale of a time with you folk, um, and we expect to continue because it's starting to feel like a five-year project. I think I said three a couple, a couple months ago. So, um, how to begin? I, what I think should happen is uh, the video that we did should be shown because it's informative and it reads the poem differently and adds some more information to the poem. Uh, uh, and thereafter, I'll start to talk a little bit about what this project has done to our studio. Because if we're going to do this correctly, there's a whole bunch of research needing done. And I'm going to talk about that um, and how to form research teams and how to fund them, things of that sort, um, and raise questions um, after the video. Is that okay? From the perspective of the waters, the topsoil, the forest, the atmosphere, and the body of mind. On the deep wealth of this nation, Scotland. Scotland becomes the first country in the history of countries to intentionally give back more to the life web than it consumes. 
when the deep wealth of the country is understood to be in part a vast commons, the topsoil. The wealth becomes magnified when the topsoil is attended to, beginning by transforming all organic waste into humus and continuing the regenerating of carbon in the topsoil mat while banning all inorganic fertilizers. The deep wealth of the country is maintained by the oxygen the trees put forth and the CO2 the trees and all green growing things sequester. When CO2 sequestering lowers the atmospheric CO2 and the carbon production is greater than the consumption, the wealth in the atmospheric commons of the country grows. True for all culturally generated CO2 production, but also true for the breadth of the 5.3 million people in Scotland that requires some 1,500 square miles of open canopy forest. Assuming 70 trees per acre or 30 trees per person to compensate simply for the privilege of breathing. Breathing in the country and the consumption of oxygen and the production of CO2 equalize as the forest matures. Thereafter, wealth grows as the forest commons grow. The moment is urgent. If business as usual continues, Scotland as usual will continue to have a carbon footprint over three times its physical size. To do nothing risks the death of the life web. To do too little risks near death and a sixth extinction. To do enough, we cannot know without the doing of it. The wealth of the country is in its waters, especially the rainfall. About 113 cubic kilometers fall a year on average on these lands. If the excess waters that form the aquatic commons of the nation are redirected into an array of estuarial lagoons or drought-ridden farming areas or bogs and small lakes and wetlands, the redirection expressed in new food that is produced. Also, the biodiversity of the country increases and the cost of flood control decreases, so increases the deep wealth of the nation. When the wealth of the Scottish nation becomes great enough to trade for what it cannot produce, and this wealth springs from the life web in such a way that the web's overproduction is harvested, the harvest preserves and can even enhance the system. It is in this way that Scotland becomes the first nation in the history of nations to generate its deep wealth ecologically, tuned to the original people's lifeways, and the delusion of an invisible hand disappears. The deep wealth of this nation can grow exponentially. When agreement is found in a majority of its 5.3 million population to gain a collective responsibility for the well working of the life web sufficient to stimulate the web to overproduce in ways that advantage the web and advantage the human community. Scotland has this opportunity, appearing most clearly in the relationship of a modestly sized educated population to the 30,000 square miles of land variously available. Coupled with an initial unity of beliefs at work, Scotland can become the first modern nation to stimulate then put to work the overproduction of its life web as a vast public good. In so doing, also becoming the first people in modern history to reach an ecologically informed commons of mind, itself a mega niche among the multi-million species that nest within the great web of life. And yet the waters will rise, covering about 10% of the lands, and in so happening, the continuous land of Scotland becomes three islands. The upward movement of people and infrastructure annoying, yet the five great commons need not find it difficult to adapt. Okay, um, we were able to keep that to about five minutes. 
uh, one of the things and um, reasons why we work as poets is that poetry is a language of condensation, metaphor, and narrative, narratives that construct images in the mind. So the poem, sometimes like a page of poetry, would unpack into a 20 page discursive document. And that's what, um, but we need, but we can't have 20 pages on the wall as an artist, as artists. The best we can expect from anybody is to stand in front of our image for a couple minutes. And if you know the poem broken up into six parts under six, on, on six images, um, does just that. So the thing that I want to talk about and that I want to throw open to question is what this has shown us. Our research, you know, we're research-based types and artists. We work at a university, we uh, um, talk to lots of thinkers of one kind or another, do a lot of reading, um, and are ecologically informed reasonably holds in the information, obviously. And here's something we found. The most important thing is a question that we're posing and that we formed a team and funded ourselves to begin to look into. The question is this, it's based on, on redundancy in, in life systems. Um, everything that lives, that reproduces, Everything that lives and continues reproducing or will continue to reproduce until something stops it. So that's, a, that's how redundancy uh, happens in the uh, um, everyday life of the 3.3 billion year web that we live in and are part of. Well, the question we posed is, can we, as humans, stop being the principal takers and destruct destroyers of our own life web, um, which, you know, 21st century capitalism and earlier capitalism has done since it takes without giving back. Well, other species are, um, they take and give simultaneously. So we asked ourselves, is it possible to, um, influence the life web itself to overproduce, take our waste energies uh, um, and, and reform them so that they become part of the, the overproduction, and then let the overproduction benefit ourselves while our processes of harvesting um, enhance and maybe even increase the uh, vitality of the web itself. That way we would be in, in that way, way a deep bioecological, human ecological discourse would happen and, and continue. As a matter of fact, one of the words that I avoid, everybody else uses it, I avoid the word sustainability. Now, I know what, what sort of, uh, uh, what, 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 that, what that means is, can you have a system that, can, that keeps on going and doesn't change much so you can use it? In truth, we live in a state of continuing change. So the real thing we should be thinking about is not sustainability, but continuing. And so that's one of the things that will influence our, uh, our research here. We put together uh, um, three, folk, three people, uh, and fund, we're funding them now, we'll call our first meeting. One is a biologist of note, Paul Mankiewicz. Another, the former director of the uh, the present director, I think, of Rainforest, Renil Sinanayaka, an old friend, and a stunningly intuitive uh, permaculturist named Joel Glansberg. And we'll start to design and see if we can't design ways of thinking about this. Well, that's one comment. Uh, uh, another kind of experimentation that we're doing is uh, uh, posing a question, can you set up um, a million person or multi-million person conversation on, with this subject matter, uh, with urgency driving it. And the answer to that is maybe, and we have folk at our school who've studied how to do this, and we are also putting together the funds to, to start this study. Soon we run out of money, of course. Uh, 
So those would be two studies that we're starting, but we will then begin studies of whatever we can on the other commons. The forest work is well known and, and, and almost done here at, and with, with, with your, your researchers in this country, particularly the Hutton and the folk who astonish us with, with, with the depth of their knowledge. And uh, then there's, a, there's the issue of, of, of the wastes. It turns out that if you took the organic waste of, of all and everything uh, that is discarded and reprocessed it in such a way that it turned into humus, that humus could fertilize about a quarter of the 30, 200 square kilometers of farmland uh, um, and make it so that you didn't need fertilizer at all. It would be the fertilizer. Or seen differently, it could give all 3,200 square kilometers of farmland, a quarter of the new humus needs, and therefore they need, and therefore you can start to think about how you could increase the farmland somewhat. Uh, or, but, but most important, how you can increase the carbon in the light and the life web and in the soil mat, and therefore increase the soil mat increases the sequestration of carbon as, as well as the forests. So that's the kind of stuff we're thinking about trying to think clearly about succeeding a bit here and there and facing many frustrations. Water. Ah, yes, water. I don't know my Kelly just said I forgot about water. Turns out that there are, um, let me see, uh, oh, 113 cubic kilometers of water fall on the land. Um, well, there are, um, 80 cubic kilometers of runoff. And we think, well, what would happen if we could harvest half of the runoff or one third of the cubic kilometers of fall or 40 cubic kilometers, which turns out to be 40 billion cubic meters. Or turn, if thinking in dollar terms for a minute, um, maybe pounds, um, uh, a cubic, uh, of a meter of, of, of water runs at about three pounds. You put 120 billion uh, pounds, which is enough money to create the infrastructure over a three or four year period. And therefore you would be enriching the country and improving it simultaneously because the act of, because of, you would have to engage in really sophisticated ecological design so that the act of harvesting these waters it's also the act of generating uh, deeper, a deeper, a deeper, um, I guess you call it biodiversity or complexity in, 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 in biodiverse holdings of the country. So, um, with that kind of uh, thinking, I'd like to open to question. Um, and anyone who has a curiosity should sound off at this moment. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Newton. Um, we'll just take 30 seconds here to assemble a few chairs. And just to explain how the Q&A will go, as, as Lorraine mentioned, there's quite a few people tying in by webinar, so tying in remotely. And they will be using the chat. Yes, if they're listening. So there's a chat function on Zoom, which is at the bottom of the screen towards the right. If they can type their questions, then we'll take questions sort of alternately, depending how many there are. Questions from here, and then every so often, I'll take questions from the, from the webinar people. If I could, could, we thought the team that's, it's quite a big team been working on this, but the few of us that have been sort of leading this, if they could come and sit here, I could introduce them. Then just in case there are questions that relate to what's happening at this end, then Newton can bounce a question back to us. And the way we'll do the questions, just to make sure that Newton has heard them, because well, as you can gather here, the link is not perfect. Um, if you can say who you are and then ask a question, 
quite succinctly, because I will repeat the question to make sure Newton has heard it before he then replies. Before that, if I could just introduce the, the team here who's been working on it. Lorraine Grant's the director of the barn, probably most of you know. And then Anne Douglas, oh sorry, let's start at the end because it's simpler. Susan Cooksley is at the end and Susan is one of the scientists at the James Hutton Institute, has been our key link into um, quite a number of scientists at the James Hutton who have been involved. And she's also been instrumental in helping um, acquire some of the funding which has come through Safari. And Safari is a joint venture between the James Hutton and a number of other institutes in Scotland, including the Botanics in Edinburgh. So scientists from across Scotland um, have very kindly supported the making of the film and the images that you see at the back of the hall here. Then Anne Douglas is a professor emeritus at Gray School of Art. And Chris Fremantle is a lecturer at Gray School of Art, also runs Eco Art Scotland. And both Anne and Chris have worked with Newton and Helen Harrison before on a previous project in the what, 10, 15 years ago. And actually it's that linkage that has resulted in Newton normally works with big institutions and art galleries working with a tiny place like the barn on a project like this um, and I'm, I'm Mark Hope I'm one of the volunteers at the barn here and um, and well Anne and I are currently co-chairs we rotate the chair chairmanship of the barn so so with that Newton I hope can you hear okay at that end Newton hey, are you? wonderful mm -hmm. So, who would like to ask the first question? Okay, please. Just, just speak, yes, and then I'll, I'll repeat the question. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Newton, that was a question. Um, a lady here saying she 100% agrees. It's our generation that needs to work at this problem and try to find solutions. But in terms of the particular proposal to put all the hummus on the land, there's an issue there because of all the pollution. <clears throat> we have to avoid putting the chemicals and other things other pollutants which are in that if we're going to put it on the land. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a lot of trust in the earth. Uh, the earth has the ability to process a number of these, a number of, the, of even heavy metals and uh, up to a point. I also think that I have a lot of trust in specific kinds of science that can uh, precipitate out of slurries uh, some of the worst things like some of the overproduction of mercury, overproduction of, of, of uh, arsenic um, and other heavy metals, cadmium for instance. And so um, it's true that we have made problems enormously difficult. Enormously difficult does not mean impossible. Uh, what that means is they're going to be more expensive. And what that means is that we really need to restart redirecting resources. Um, one of the proposals we have is a trillion dollar uh, rehab of the whole peninsula of Europe to catch water so that, it, so that a drought can be aver averted and civil disruption uh, 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 averted. So, I mean, we've got to stop this, putting money into war, into and to just dumb things. Um, uh, for instance, the MacArthur Foundation in our country just put $100 million, more than that, into um, oh, 30 or 40 major grants that resolve uh, social issues. Well, not one thing went, not one amount of money went to uh, resolving the life web race crisis. So we have to start thinking about how to redirect resources 
That means we need to think about uh, legislation um, and new kinds of jobs, and we have to re-educate ourselves somewhat differently. Um, uh, and there's, for instance, you, we have this enormous problem, which is the belief that if we go much over a degree and a half warmer, why then catastrophe will happen? Um, I actually think we'll be lucky to stop at three degrees. My paleobotanist from the, we're studying 55 million years ago, and when we had ice free planet, think that we're not going to stop before six degrees. Um, and so there's a lot of disagreement, but, we, but we've got to go through these changes. And the basic thing is the change of mind. That's why we have a, we're talking about a commons of mind here. And how do we start doing it? Here would be easier than any other place I can think of because you have an educated, erudite public, much more so than you realize if you come to my country, <laughs> you really get it. Um, so the answer is yes, you're right. These are difficulties. They're just simply not impossible. Thank you, Newton. There's one a question on, from somebody online. It's saying, <clears throat> could you talk a little more about the research around how to have a multi-million person conversation? I wish I could. Um, the person who's starting the research with us is a friend of ours named Warren Sack, who's a, a social scientist and artist of note, and he's done this kind of research. So if you want to know what I know, um, look up Warren Sack on the net and, st and study his work on large conversations. Uh, we, he, he's, we live very close to one another, and we expect to start struggling with this um, and then finding uh, 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 people in this country, in Scotland as well, and, and start struggling with this in the next couple of weeks. I see it as a, a, at least a year, year and a half project, and I see it as uh, costing, well, we, can, we have enough funding in our group to start it. We don't have enough money to continue. Thank you, Nathan. Other, and another question here? Please, could you, could you introduce yourself as well? Right, thank you. So the question is from Petra from the James Hutton Institute, asking how do we translate this um, this thinking, um, regional thinking, into local action. You're seeing an example of it as we speak, but um, there's a, we have these problems that come like like businesses the bottom line results every three months. Uh, three years is a long way out of planning. Yet we need to plan in, in 10 year and 10 year and 20 and 30 and 40 year increments. A number of our works do this. Um, so I think you should rephrase the question. Are you asking how we do this or how we do it rapidly enough or where do we get the funds to do it or where do we get the will to do it? <laughs> Sorry to ask questions back, but... Well, no, she's saying, does she have to choose? <laughs> There's no pressure. Um, uh, one minute, Newton, sorry. Let's talk about... Oh, she's saying, let's talk about the time scale, Newton. Okay. Um, I think that, for instance, the experimentation that would be needed uh, on, on um, asking the web to uh, um, overproduce to our advantage will take us um, about a year and $10,000 worth of, of meetings and gather, maybe 15 and gatherings and uh, um, three or four papers to be written before we could get a grasp on the problem, uh, of whether we could do it. Why? 
because they're, we're working with complex systems. Uh, if you take a look at what we're doing, we're, you don't see cause and effect. Problem, cause, work it out, effect, okay, next. These are complex systems. You cannot know them that way. You can know a lot about them. Therefore, there are unintended consequences. Um, some of those unintended consequences would be unwanted, which is what the first question asks about pollution in the earth. Uh, um, and so some kinds of, we're not quite sure how to begin, but we have this, some very smart people and we will indeed talk about time later. I don't see how we can do most of this in less than a decade, uh, uh, get enough on the ground to uh, uh, pull in the, I guess you would call millions of pounds to get the whole thing going, because you would have to redirect how you spend your taxes. Uh, I don't know, did I answer your question okay? Yes, thank you, Newton. Another question. No, please. Yes. Why are you looking particularly at Scotland? Um, Denmark has five million people. There are other small countries. Well, first of all, we see our, our group sees ourselves as a random moving part in the environment. Therefore, we go where we're invited. And we only accept an invitation if we're networked with uh, people who can work with us and teach us, like the, the people of the Hutton Institute, um, and soon others as we engage in other things. Um, and, and so we didn't choose Scotland. Scotland chose us. Um, and for that, we say thank you. There's a, another reason why we're stunned by the, the uh, um, opportunity here. It's because you're not overpopulated. You actually average about a little, a little under three acres a person. Uh, in some places, there's a, 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 a like 50, 50 people an acre. Um, so uh, we're interested in, in a larger vision. And that is that there, there are probably 30 or 40 smaller countries like this and that have small populations of larger land masses. And that we think that if we're able to work this out in Scotland, it'll be, it'll be able to be worked out. That is the commons, the experimentation would be different, but the concepts would transfer. And we could build, and over time, a large enough group of small countries could band and become one big enough effort so that you could talk the more bullheaded, pigheaded countries like mine and Russia and to a degree, to a lesser degree, China, uh, the, the intractable countries, the overpopulated countries, uh, um, uh, to take on this kind of change. If we don't take it on, of course, we, the outcomes are terrible. Does that answer? Yes, thank you. Please. Genevieve, do you want to introduce yourself, Genevieve? Okay, Newton. The question is, is that you're talking about that we're underpopulated or nicely populated, depending on your point of view, as are places like Norway and Scandinavia. But meanwhile, there's millions and millions of people on the move from countries all over the world, mostly from the global south, but from all over the world, whose climate is already unusable um, and whose country is already unusable, um, both through climate and through war. And you can discuss climate and and their interrelationship, if you like. But how do you, how do you envisage, to not get too bogged down in the politics, how do you envisage keeping these nice small countries where we're going to be sequestrating our carbon and doing wonderful things, isolated from the rest of the world, which is basically undergoing huge change, especially if we have the climate temperature, the global temperature rises and sea level rises that go with it. So we'll have less land. So there's millions of people with nowhere to live. Well, I can tell straight off, cannibalism won't work. So something else has, something has to happen, but I don't know what. 
Um, a friend of mine, a museum director back in the 60s, was uh, going, in, was flying over and uh, spending time in India with one of the Rockefellers. And he said, why don't you sell them birth control uh, things so this overpopulation back in the 60s was obvious. The answer was, well, we wouldn't want to do that because we need population to expand, for market to expand, for, prof for profitability to expand. Well, you have, when you have that kind of belief operating uh, um, and you have diminishing resources and increasing demand and you're asking me what I would do, um, I think I have to ask you what you would do. Um, there are some things that there's nothing you can do about. Um, they have to self-solve. Um, it may well be, for instance, that the small countries that I'm talking about could be overrun and everything we try to do done in, at which point then um, uh, massive starvation moves in, uh, the drought gets much worse, food production reduces, um, and you have uh, a ton of catastrophes that need um, different kinds of thinking than I offer here. So the, my answer to your question is you've asked an unanswerable question. Sometimes there are un unanswerable questions, but that doesn't mean I should stop doing what I'm doing and we should stop doing what we're doing. Thank you, Newton. Another question? Please. Oh, sorry, um, my name's Anne-Marie. Uh, I work at the Hutton as well, but I'm in finance. <laughs> uh, it seems to me that um, you maybe need to start with some sort of model. Um, there's lots of landowners and people in Scotland that you'd have to involve to change the use of their land um, to cope with, you know, the way that we want to go producing more food. Um, you know, spreading people out more so there's more local food and local resources so they don't have to rely on um, other countries so much. Um, so you don't have so much, um, you know, air travel and stuff like that. So you need to maybe find somebody, some landowners who are willing to look at some sort of model with scientists and how to change the use of the land, how to sustain a certain amount of people sort of going back to basics but again, using all our new technology and trying to, to change things and then trying to spread it. So you need to have lots of different people involved and you need to have the backing of government and local councils. Um, it needs to be something that's led by the government and it needs to have lots of different um, committees who then feed up to a major committee who can make decisions on the best way to go. It's going to take a long time, but you have to start small. You can't just expect it to suddenly explode and work. Um, you know, and you've got to introduce people to it in a small way. And locally, Aberdeen City Council, I see, is putting out, had put out a consultation about what people thought about producing food locally. Now, I don't know how well, um, uh, you know, how, how well known that was but more needs to be done on that scale to get, make people aware of what they can do and try and get more people involved in that. So more needs to be done and more media needs to be um, you know, done about it and more scientists need to be more vocal and, and more, we need to have more, um, what's it called? Ecological warriors. Um, we need to have more people like that. Thank you. Did you hear that okay, Newton? Yep. Um, how can I say this? Um, I think you're right on the face of it. But I think there's another side that I'd like to talk to. What I've found in our work that um, it's so complex that bottom up doesn't work. Uh, what I, what we, what our best work has happened, strangely, when we've worked from the middle, both downward and upward. Uh, we have worked in Holland, for instance, where we did this to enormous success. So I do believe you're right that, that, that um, different examples have to start on the ground. And I do believe also that you're suggesting 
that certain kinds of self-organization need to happen. And that you're also suggesting that um, some inspired leadership has to happen. All of these are true. Um, and I think if the poetry is magical enough and the situation urgent enough as the population question person rose right before you, our question, it urgent enough, people may be willing to engage in just what you're doing, what you're saying. And, but I think what you're saying has to be sort of um, happen in many places at once, like, like go viral on the ground almost and be little and big also. And that's why the million person conversation we think is so important. Uh, I don't, moreover, I don't think I can answer your question part by part on an intimate level. I don't know enough. Thank you, Newton. There's a question here from the webinar. Could you talk about how we redirect resources without linking it into a market-driven system? Huh. Well, you got a 50-50. Um, it's something about, I actually believe that power corrupts, a little power corrupts a little and a lot of power corrupts a lot. And so when you're redirecting resources, people skimming from it for their personal advantage um, is always a problem. Um, I, I think the only thing that can work is, is um, a consensus about the urgency. Um, I found, for instance, in some places where the consensus is powerful enough, um, integrity works. Um, and I think that, again, we have to go back to the little and the big. The little would be smaller things happening on the ground in a self-organizing way, and the large being redesigning and redesigning again and again this kind of a conversation that brings people together on a single uh, issue. That is to say, I, uh, the, life, the well-being of the life web itself. There's one other question here from the webinar, Newton. In the UK, most of the rain falls in the northwest, and most of the population lives in the southeast, which is classed as underwater stress. There is already talk about redirecting and installing a pipeline to take water down south. Very California. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's the question? Ah, uh, sorry, yes, it was in, it was in two parts. So the, the question was actually the one you've just answered. Could you talk about how we redirect resources without linking into the market-driven system? Sorry, it, was, it showed here as two parts. Yeah, so I think, I think you've, answered, you've answered that question. Thank you. So is there another question here? We've maybe got time for two more questions. Yeah. The, que the question is from Kate, who's also from the James Hutton Institute. She's interested to learn a little more about the commons of mind, about the idea, how it came about, and how we arrive at the commons of mind. Well, you know, it's possible to say I don't know. See, as an artist, we depend upon um, our psyches a lot. That is, in the sciences, I find uh, that people want um, specificity of information um, and uh, in a discursive or um, maybe even in a formulaic form. Um, uh, sometimes you have to have faith. I have a lot of trouble with faith-based science when people say um, our science will get us out of our problems. Let's be patient, as one of the lead scientists at MIT said. Um, but sometimes I, get, oh, oh, I was sitting thinking, and I thought, how would we get a whole bunch of people, like four or five million people, to agree to this? Because we're going to have to agree to redirect resources in a, ma in a major way, and then lives will change as accordingly. Maybe even get more interesting and more pleasant, uh, but they will change. And change, inertia in systems is endemic and very hard to maneuver. 
And so I can't answer your question except to say that it came to me one afternoon when I was sitting thinking, what, I, what would I do? And the answer was, well, let's see if we can't get everybody thinking the same way or close to it or come to a common understanding. And I have a friend named Warren Sack, and he's already worried about this. And he has other friends who's worried about it. So I intend to get everybody together and find out how we can think our way through it. So I can't answer your question specifically. But I think if we talk about this in some, oh, six months to a year, I'll be able to throw some light on it. I hope that doesn't sound like a cop uh, Hi, Newton. Um, sorry, it's Chris. And we've got a question from Antonio, who I believe you've met in, uh, from Spain. Yes. Um, I think he came and visited you last year. And I'm going to try and interpret, because it, it, I think Antonio's question is, can you talk a little bit about how the specific place that the barn is in, in Bankery on the River D in Aberdeenshire, then relates up to the complex systems that you've highlighted at a, at a Scotland-wide scale? And, you know, how do, how do you work between, how do you move from the, from the scale of the local to the scale of the national? Okay. First, we think we're invited by Anne and Chris, uh, and then later Mark, to come to the barn and come and think and maybe do a work, like a, a, a one of our future gardens, which is in the book written. You should take, take a look and see what they are. They're preemptive planning at a local level, uh, botanically driven. Um, and so we go there, and I, I make a mistake. Um, I'm looking at the map, and I see a river on one side of Aberdeen and a river on the other, and I see that this city has just wrecked the floodplain of two rivers. And so I come and say, is that true? And I think I'm, and I'm, then I'm told, no, it's not true. Why is it not true? Because there's a, there are ridges in between those two rivers that were never the floodplain in the first place. And there's a lot of the building went on the high, high grounds, although clearly farming around has affected that. So uh, then the issue of flood control comes up. So um, we've been trying to do something that we call a, a, a ring of many floodplains. Many, many cities have taken rivers, floodplains away, built dikes to hold flooding back. And so the, the act of flood control, the metaphor that drives it, um, is the uh, act of flood control, at least in our country, is the destruction of rivers or riverine ecosystems. Anyway. And so, uh, well, if that's a metaphor, that is flood control is the destruction of rivers, what if we flip the metaphor? What if we say, well, flood control is the spreading of waters? What that would mean is that we start to look at the, the say, the D or whatever on the rivers, and we count feet per second moving, and when the feet per second um, exceeded a certain amount, that's when flooding took place, and that's when waters would start to spread, hopefully field to field. Now, that raises the problem. Flood, if it floods field to field, there are benefits to, for those fields, especially the increased fertilization sometimes. Uh, but there's, there's also the loss of crops. And so if you're going to spread waters on already cropped land, then you have to compensate the, the farmer. Well, then you have to think, well, if you compensate the farmer and the, and the, the compensation is less than the cost of flood control, you, you have a win-win situation, providing the farmer doesn't feel invaded and compelled and beat up, which uh, I think um, it, it's profitable enough. It's just a way of looking at water as another crop. So that's the kind of thinking that we do. Well, what is that? That led us to looking at an airplane flight up and down the river. And then, uh, then we began asking questions like, well, how much rain does fall on this country? Well, my God, that's a lot of rain, you know, like uh, 113 cubic kilometers, a cubic kilometer is a billion cubic meters. That's a hell of a lot of rain. 
And so that then we're thinking, well, why don't we think about the commons? And so then we began to think about the forest, the people as a commons, um, the air as a commons, and uh, the, the, the aquatic commons. And we began to create with those things. So we work by a kind of free association. And I'm not prepared to say what we will associate because we haven't encountered the circumstances that drive the processes of association unless we're in a place dealing with what everybody's worried about in the first place. And that's as good an answer as I can give you, Antonio. Thank you, Newton. I think we'll just take one more question here and then we'll close this part of the... Hi, uh, my name's Scott, I'm from Aberdeen. Uh, I'm just interested in uh, to your response to perhaps finding out, so you talk about Scotland is in a unique position, but there's other things of Scotland which is fairly unique, uh, especially in Europe, is, is in terms of its sort of land ownership uh, structure. And I was just wondering how, you, yeah, what your response, so you talk about a commons, uh, but I was just wondering your response to perhaps finding out in terms of the sort of concentration of uh, land ownership in Scotland and whether that's a, an actual opportunity or, or a barrier to the, the, the vision which uh, you've described. Well, your, your, your land ownership, I guess, habits are um, completely strange to me. Um, you have uh, a limited number of 40 or 50 families or groups of people owning maybe 60% of the land. Um, that's, uh, then you have, of those people, uh, some who want, want to conserve, some who want to evolve, and some who want to take. And you have, um, uh, you have to build a consensus among them. Uh, I don't know any other way to do that than the way we're proceeding with, with, the, with the commons of mind. I do believe that there are ways that all lands can be both generative ecologically and supportive economically. And that where the, the ecological concern has to preempt the economic one if you're going to continue over the long term. When the economic one preempts the ecological one, that means you're not going to be able to continue over the long term because you will consume more resources than the place will create. So you've asked me what, what, how to think about it. That's how I've started to think about it. And I think other people are thinking about it too. I think the sense that, that, um, that there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of disagreement that so few people could own so much. But that's the fact of it. I don't know. Can you tell me whether I've answered your question? Yep, yep, he's happy with that answer, Newton. Newton, I think if you're happy to close there, um, it's been amazing and the technology has mostly worked. Not perfectly, <laughs> but, but pretty well and certainly better than us trying to get to California or you trying to get here this evening. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. And I wanted to... Um, close. There'll be more networking here. I just want to explain where this, where we're going next, and then we can maybe express our appreciation to, to Newton. So this this project started last September when Newton and his team made a trip here, spent ten days travelling around, meeting people, talking to many people, most mostly scientists. In fact, um, this is the launch of Newton's vision for Scotland. Our initial invitation involved just the D Valley. And then Newton suggested, well, it needs to include the Don Valley if it's the D. And then when he got back to California, it evolved into this vision for Scotland. But this is, this is emerging work. This is a very early stage. As Newton mentioned, we originally thought it might be a three-year project. Now we're thinking it's a five-year project. But actually, as people here have mentioned, if this gets traction, this is, this is decades of work. This is what we need to do to respond to climate change, to respond to other social issues that are exacerbated by climate change. So this is, 
if you like, a very small start of, a, of an emerging, but we think very important piece of work. And Newton will be visiting Scotland. The next um, public event will be an exhibition here in the middle of September that Newton will be staging here. And then there'll be a round table discussion, the detail to be agreed, but that's in a, something like 15th, 16th September. And then the following week, we are planning to, for Newton to uh, make a presentation in the Scottish Parliament. Um, our local MSP, Alex, is, is very kindly sponsoring that. So there'll be a conversation continuing in the Central Belt. And we hope to continue this conversation, different conversations, many conversations over, over the next while. And we hope to welcome you back here in September to the exhibition.